This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. The Odyssey by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book 5. And now, as dawn rose from her couch besides Tithonus, harbinger of light alike to mortals and immortals, the gods met in council, and with them, Jove the lord of thunder, who is their king. Thereon Minerva began to tell them of the many sufferings of Ulysses, for she pitied him away there in the house of the nymph Calypso. Father Jove, said she, and all you other gods that live in everlasting bliss, I hope there may never be such a thing as a kind and well-disposed ruler any more nor one who will govern equitably. I hope they will all be henceforth cruel and unjust, for there is not one of his subjects but has forgotten Ulysses, who ruled them as though he were their father. There he is, lying in great pain, in an island where dwells the nymph Calypso, who will not let him go, and he cannot get back to his own country for he can find neither ships nor sailors to take him over the sea. Furthermore, wicked people are now trying to murder his only son, Delamarchus, who is coming home from Elis and Lacedaemon, where he has been to see if he can get further news of his father. What, my dear, are you talking about? replied her father. Did you not send him there yourself? because you thought it would help Ulysses to get home and punish the suitors. Besides, you are perfectly able to protect Telemachus and to see him safely home again. While the suitors have to come hurry, scurrying back without having killed him. When he had thus spoken, he said to his son Mercury, Mercury, you are our messenger. Go therefore and tell Calypso we have decreed that poor Ulysses is to return home. He is to be convoyed neither by gods nor men, but after a perilous voyage of twenty days upon a raft, he is to reach fertile Syria, the land of the Phaeacians, who are near of kin to the gods, and will honor him as though he were one of ourselves. They will send him in a ship to his own country, and will give him more bronze and gold and raiment than he would have brought back from Troy, if he had had all his prize money and had got home without disaster. This is how we have settled that he shall return to his country and his friends. Thus he spoke, and Mercury, guide and guardian, slayer of Argus, did as he was told. Forthwith he bound on his glittering golden sandals, with which he could fly like the wind over land and sea. He took the wand with which he seals men's eyes in sleep, or wakes them just as he pleases, and flew holding it in his hand over Pyria. Then he swooped down through the firmament till he reached the level of the sea, whose waves he skimmed like a cormorant that flies fishing every hole and corner of the ocean, and drenching its thick plumage in the spray. He flew and flew over many a weary wave, but when, at last, he got to the island, which was his journey's end, he left the sea, and went on by land, till he came to the cave where the nymph Calypso lived. He found her at home. There was a large fire burning on the hearth, and one could smell from far the fragrant reek of burning cedar and sandalwood. As for herself, she was busy at her loom, shooting her golden shuttle through the warp and singing beautifully. Round her cave there was a thick wood of alder, poplar, and sweet-smelling cypress trees, wherein all kinds of great birds had built their nests, owls, hawks, and chattering sea-crows that occupy their business in the waters. A vine loaded with grapes was trained and grew luxuriantly about the mouth of the cave. There were also four running rills of water in channels cut pretty close together, and turned hither and thither, so as to irrigate the beds of violets and luscious herbage over which they flowed. Even a god could not help being charmed with such a lovely spot. So Mercury stood still and looked at it. 
but when he had admired it sufficiently, he went inside the cave. Calypso knew him at once, for the gods all know each other, no matter how far they live from one another. But Ulysses was not within. He was on the seashore, as usual, looking out upon the barren ocean, with tears in his eyes, groaning and breaking his heart for sorrow. Calypso gave Mercury a seat, and said, Why have you come to see me, Mercury? Honored and ever welcome, for you do not visit me often. Say what you want, I will do it for you at once, if I can, and if it can be done at all. But come inside, and let me set refreshment before you. As she spoke, she drew a table loaded with ambrosia beside him, and mixed him some red nectar. So Mercury ate and drank till he had had enough, and then said, We are speaking God and goddess to one another. And you ask me why I have come here, and I will tell you truly, as you would have me do. Jove sent me. It was no doing of mine. Who could possibly want to come all this way over the sea, where there are no cities full of people to offer me sacrifices or choice hecatombs? Nevertheless, I had to come, for none of us other gods can cross Jove, nor transgress his orders. He says that you have here the most ill-starred of all those who fought nine years before the city of King Priam, and sailed home in the tenth year after having sacked it. On their way home they sinned against Minerva, who raised both wind and waves against them, so that all his brave companions perished, and he alone was carried hither by wind and died. Jove says that you are to let this man go at once, for it is decreed that he shall not perish here, far from his own people, but shall return to his house and country and see his friends again. Calypso trembled with rage when she heard this. You gods, she exclaimed, ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You are always jealous and hate seeing a goddess take a fancy to a mortal man and live with him in open matrimony. So when rosy-fingered dawn made love to Orion, you precious gods were all of you furious till Diana went and killed him in Ortasia. So again, when Ceres fell in love with Aeacian, and yielded to him in a thrice-ploughed fallow field, Jove came to hear of it before so long, and killed Aeacian with his thunderbolts. And now you are angry with me, too, because I have a man here. I found the poor creature sitting all alone astride of a keel, for Jove had struck his ship with lightning and sunk it in mid-ocean, so that all his crew were drowned, while he himself was driven by wind and waves on to my island. I got fond of him, and cherished him, and had set my heart on making him immortal, so that he should never grow old all his days. Still I cannot cross Jove, nor bring his counsels to nothing." Therefore, if he insists upon it, let the man go beyond the seas again. But I cannot send him anywhere myself, for I have neither ships nor men who can take him. Nevertheless, I will readily give him such advice in all good faith as will be likely to bring him safely to his own country. Then send him away, said Mercury, or Jove will be angry with you and punish you. On this he took his leave. And Calypso went out to look for Ulysses, for she had heard Jove's message. She found him sitting upon the beach, with his eyes ever filled with tears, and dying of sheer homesickness, for he had got tired of Calypso. And though he was forced to sleep with her in the cave by night, it was she, not he, that would have it so. As for the daytime, he spent it on the rocks and on the seashore, weeping, crying aloud for his despair, and always looking out upon the sea. Calypso then went close up to him and said, My poor fellow, you shall not stay here grieving and fretting your life out any longer. I am going to send you away of my own free will. So go, cut some beams of wood, and make yourself a large raft, with an upper deck that it may carry you safely over the sea. I will put bread, wine, and water on board to save you from starving. I will also give you clothes, and will send you a fair wind to take you home, if the gods in heaven so will it, for they know more about these things, and can settle them better than I can. Ulysses shuddered as he heard her. Now, goddess, he answered, there is something behind all this. You cannot be really meaning to help me home when you bid me do such a dreadful thing as put to sea on a raft. 
not even a well-found ship with a fair wind could venture on such a distant voyage nothing that you can say or do so make me go on board a raft unless you first solemnly swear that you mean me no mischief calypso smiled at this and caressed him with her hand you know a great deal said she but you are quite wrong here may heaven above and earth below be my witnesses with the waters of the river styx and this is the most solemn oath which a blessed god can take that i mean you no sort of harm and am only advising you to do exactly what i should do myself in your place i am dealing with you quite straightforwardly my heart is not made of iron and i am very sorry for you when she had thus spoken she led the way rapidly before him and ulysses followed in her steps so the pair goddess and man went on and on till they came to calypso's cave where ulysses took the seat that mercury had just left calypso set meat and drink before him of the food that mortals eat but her maids brought ambrosia and nectar for herself and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them when they had satisfied themselves with meat and drink calypso spoke saying ulysses noble son of laertes so you would start home to your own land at once good luck go with you but if you could only know how much suffering is in store for you before you get back to your own country you would stay where you are keep house along with me and let me make you immortal no matter how anxious you may be to see this wife of yours of whom you are thinking all the time day after day yet i flatter myself that i am no whit less tall or well-looking than she is for it is not to be expected that a mortal woman should compare in beauty with an immortal goddess replied ulysses do not be angry with me about this i am quite aware that my wife penelope is nothing like so tall or so beautiful as yourself she is only a woman whereas you are an immortal nevertheless i want to get home and can think of nothing else if some god wrecks me when i am on the sea i will bear it and make the best of it i have had infinite trouble both by land and sea already so let this go with the rest presently the sun set and it became dark whereon the bear retired into the inner part of the cave and went to bed when the child of morning rosy-fingered dawn appeared ulysses put on his shirt and cloak while the goddess wore a dress of a light gossamer fabric very fine and graceful with a beautiful golden girdle about her waist and a veil to cover her head she at once set herself to think how she could speed ulysses on his way so she gave him a great bronze axe that suited his hands it was sharpened on both sides and had a beautiful olive wood handle fitted firmly on to it she also gave him a sharp adze and then led the way to the far end of the island where the largest trees grow alder poplar and pine that reach the sky very dry and well seasoned so as to sail light for him in the water then when she had shown him where the best trees grow calypso went home leaving him to cut them which he soon finished doing he cut down twenty trees in all and adds them smooth squaring them by rule in good workmanlike fashion meanwhile calypso came back with some augers so he bore holes with them and fitted the timbers together with bolts and rivets he made the raft as broad as a skilled shipwright makes the beam of a large vessel and he filed a deck on top of the ribs and ran a gunwale all around it he also made a mast of yard-arm and a rudder to steer with he fenced the raft all round with wicker hurdles as a protection against the waves and then he threw on a quantity of wood by and by calypso brought him some linen to make the sails and he made these too excellently making them fast with braces and sheets last of all with the help of levers he drew the raft down into the water in four days he had completed the whole work and on the fifth calypso sent him from the island after washing him and giving him some clean clothes she gave him a goat-skin full of black wine and another larger one of water she also gave him a wallet full of provisions and found him much good meat moreover she made the wind fair and warm for him and gladly did ulysses spread his sail before it while he sat and guided the raft skilfully by means of the rudder he never closed his eyes but kept them fixed on the pleiades 
on late setting boots and on the bear which men also call the wain and which turns round and round where it is facing orion and alone never dipping into the stream of oceanus for calypso had told him to keep this to his left days seven and ten did he sail over the sea and on the eighteenth the dim outlines of the mountains on the nearest part of the phaeacian coast appeared rising like a shield on the horizon but king neptune who was returning from the ethiopians caught sight of ulysses a long way off from the mountains of the salome he could see him sailing upon the sea and it made him very angry so he wagged his head and muttered to himself saying heavens so the gods have been changing their minds about ulysses while i was away in ethiopia and now he is close to the land of the phaeacians where it is decreed that he shall escape from the calamities that have befallen him till he shall have plenty of hardship yet before he has done with it thereon he gathered his clouds together grasped his trident turned it round in the sea and roused the rage of every wind that blows till earth sea and sky were hidden in cloud and night sprang forth out of the heavens winds from east south north and west fell upon him all at the same time and a tremendous sea got up so that ulysses heart began to fail him alas he said to himself in his dismay whatever will become of me i am afraid calypso was right when she said i should have trouble by sea before i got back home it is all coming true how black is jove making heaven with his clouds and what a sea the winds are raising from every quarter at once i am now safe to perish blessed and thrice blessed were those danans who fell before troy in the cause of the sons of atreus would that had been killed on the day when the trojans were pressing me so sorely about the dead body of achilles for then i should have had due burial and the achaeans would have honoured my name but now it seems that i shall come to a most pitiable end as he spoke a sea broke over him with such terrific fury that the raft reeled again and he was carried overboard a long way off he let go the helm and the force of the hurricane was so great that it broke the mast half way up and both sail and yard went over into the sea for a long time ulysses was under water and it was all he could do to rise to the surface again for the clothes calypso had given him weighed him down but at last he got his head above water and spat out the bitter brine that was running down his face in streams in spite of all this however he did not lose sight of his raft but swam as fast as he could towards it got hold of it and climbed on board again so as to escape drowning the sea took the raft and tossed it about as autumn winds whirled thistle down round and round upon a road it was as though the south north east and west winds were all playing battledore and shuttlecock with it at once when he was in this plight eno daughter of cadmus also called leucothea saw him she had formerly been a mere mortal but had been since raised to the rank of a marine goddess seeing in what great distress ulysses now was she had compassion upon him and rising like a seagull from the waves took her seat upon the raft my poor good man said she why is neptune so furiously angry with you he is giving you a great deal of trouble but for all his bluster he will not kill you you seem to be a sensible person do then as i bid you strip leave your off to drive before the wind and swim to the phaeacian coast where better luck awaits you and here take my veil and put it round your chest it is enchanted and you can come to no harm so long as you wear it as soon as you touch land take it off throw it back as far as you can into the sea and then go away again with these words she took off her veil and gave it to him then she dived down again like a seagull and vanished beneath the dark blue waters but ulysses did not know what to think alas he said to himself in his dismay this is only some one or other of the gods who is luring me to ruin by advising me to quit my raft at any rate i will not do so at present 
for the land where she said I should be quit of all troubles, seem to be still a good way off. I know what I will do. I am sure it will be best, no matter what happens. I will stick to the raft as long as her timbers hold together, but when the sea breaks her up, I will swim for it. I do not see how I can do any better than this. While he was thus in two minds, Neptune sent a terrible great wave that seemed to rear itself above his head, till it broke right over the raft, which then went to pieces as though it were a heap of dry chaff tossed about by a whirlwind. Ulysses got astride of one plank and rode upon it, as if he were on horseback. He then took off the clothes Calypso had given him, bound Eno's veil under his arms, and plunged into the sea, meaning to swim on shore. King Neptune watched him as he did so, and wagged his head, muttering to himself, and saying, There now, swim up and down, as you best can, till you fall in with the well-to-do people. I do not think you will be able to say that I have let you off too lightly. On this he lashed his horses, and drove to Aegea, where his palace is. But Minerva resolved to help Ulysses, so she bound the ways of all the winds except one, and made them lie quite still. But she roused a good stiff breeze from the north, that should lay the waters till Ulysses reached the land of the Phaeacians, where he would be safe. Thereon he floated about for two nights and two days in the water, with a heavy swell on the sea, and death staring him in the face. But when the third day broke, the wind fell, and there was a dead calm without so much as a breath of air stirring. As he rose on the swell, he looked eagerly ahead, and could see land quite near. Then, as children rejoice when their dear father begins to get better, after having for a long time borne sore affliction, sent him by some angry spirit, but the gods deliver him from evil. So was Ulysses thankful when he again saw land and trees, and swam on with all his strength, that he might once more set foot upon dry ground. When, however, he got within earshot, he began to hear the surf thundering up against the rock, for the swell still broke against them with a terrific roar. Everything was enveloped in spray. There were no harbors where a ship might ride, nor shelter of any kind, but only headlands, low-lying rocks, and mountain top. Ulysses' heart now began to fail him, and he said despairingly to himself, Alas, Jove has let me see land after swimming so far that I had given up all hope, but I can find no landing place, for the coast is rocky and surf-beaten. The rocks are smooth and rise sheer from the sea, with deep water close under them, so that I cannot climb out for want of foothold. I am afraid some great wave will lift me off my legs and dash me against the rocks as I leave the water, which would give me a sorry landing. If, on the other hand, I swam further in search of some shelving beach or harbor, a hurricane may carry me out to sea again, sorely against my will, or heaven may send some great monster of the deep to attack me, for Amphitrite breeds many such, and I know that Neptune is very angry with me. While he was thus in two minds, a wave caught him and took him with such force against the rocks that he would have been smashed and torn to pieces if Minerva had not shown him what to do. He caught hold of the rock with both hands and clung to it, groaning with pain, till the wave retired, so he was saved that time. But presently the wave came on again and carried him back with it, far into the sea, tearing his hands as the suckers of a polypus are torn when some one plucks it from its bed, and the stones come up along with it. Even so did the rocks tear the skin from his strong hands, and then the wave drew him deep down under the water. Here poor Ulysses would have certainly perished, even in spite of his own destiny, if Minerva had not helped him to keep his wits about him. He swam seaward again, beyond reach of the surf that was beating against the land, and at the same time he kept looking towards the shore to see if he could find some haven, or a spit that should take the waves aslant. By and by, as he swam on, he came to the mouth of a river, and here he thought would be the best place, for there were no rocks, and it afforded shelter from the wind. He felt that there was a current, so he prayed inwardly, and said, Hear me, O king! whoever you may be, and save me from the anger of the sea-god Neptune. 
for I approach you prayerfully. Anyone who has lost his way has at all times a claim even upon the gods, wherefore in my distress I draw near to your stream and cling to the knees of your river bed. Have mercy upon me, O king, for I declare myself your suppliant. Then the god stayed his stream and stilled the waves, making all calm before him and bringing him safely into the mouth of the river. Here, at last, Ulysses' knees and strong hands failed him, for the sea had completely broken him. His body was all swollen, and his mouth and nostrils ran down like a river of sea water, so that he could neither breathe nor speak, and lay swooning with sheer exhaustion. Presently, when he got his breath, and came to himself again, he took off a scarf that Eno had given him, and threw it back into the salt stream of the river, where Eno received it into her hands from the wave that bore it towards her. Then he left the river, laid himself down among the rushes, and kissed the bounteous earth. Alas, he cried to himself in his dismay, whatever will become of me, and how is it all to end? If I stay here upon the river bed, through the long watches of the night, I am so exhausted that the bitter cold and damp may make an end of me, for toward sunrise there will be a keen wind blowing from off the river. If, on the other hand, I climb the hillside, find shelter in the woods, and sleep in some thicket, I may escape the cold and have a good night's rest, but some savage beast may take advantage of me and devour me. In the end he deemed it best to take to the woods, and he found one upon some high ground not far from the water. There he crept beneath two shoots of olive that grew from a single stalk, the one an ungrafted sucker, while the other had been grafted. No wind, however squally, could break through the cover they afforded, nor could the sun's rays pierce them, nor the rain get through them, so closely did they grow into one another. Ulysses crept under these and began to make himself a bed to lie on, for there was a great litter of dead leaves lying about, enough to make a covering for two or three men, even in hard winter weather. He was glad enough to see this, so he laid himself down and heaped the leaves all round him. Then, as one who lives alone in the country, far from any neighbor, hides a brand as fire seed in the ashes to save himself from having to get a light elsewhere, even so did Ulysses cover himself up with leaves, and Minerva shed a sweet sleep upon his eyes, closed his eyelids, and made him lose all memories of his sorrows. End of Book Five